At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Matthew 18. It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Matthew 18, 14. The resurrected Savior showed his great love for little children again when he ministered to the Nephites. He took their little children one by one and blessed them, and prayed unto the Father for them. And he spake unto the multitude and said unto them, Behold your little ones. As they looked to behold, they cast their eyes toward heaven, and they saw the heavens open, and they saw angels descending out of heaven as it were in the midst of fire. And they came down and encircled those little ones about, and they were encircled about with fire, and the angels did administer to them. 3 Nephi 17, quote, If our children are really our greatest treasures, it stands to reason that they deserve our greatest attention. Parents have not just a responsibility, but a sacred duty to rear their children in love and in righteousness, to teach them to love and to serve one another, to observe the commandments of God and to be law-abiding citizens where they live. Children are of far greater value than of any kind of material wealth. President Hinckley. We could fill this devotional hour with counsel from our church leaders on our responsibilities toward the children in our lives. The messages in the scriptures and from modern-day prophets are consistent and clear. Children are to be highly valued, taught, and protected, and we need to develop some of their characteristics to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I've had the opportunity of spending many hours in the company of children in both church and school settings. It is a blessing to be in their company. I learned early in my teaching career the value of writing down what I was learning from my young students. They can be great teachers. Today, I'd like to share with you a few experiences that illustrate lessons we can and lessons we cannot learn from children, and also what caring adults need to do to provide a lifeline for children who are born into challenging families. Let's start with the lessons children do not teach well. All of you who have daily contact with children will, with children will recognize some of these from the lighter side. Lessons we cannot learn. Young children say what they think without malice or, or without forethought. A colleague who is a media specialist in Las Vegas was doing a book share with a kindergarten class about a man who was given three wishes. When she paused to ask, if you had a magic wish, what would you wish for? One wiggly five-year-old boy stood up immediately and said, I just wish you'd stop talking so we could check out our books. <laughs> Real danger areas with children are appearance and age. Miss Tuttle, do you really think your hair looks good like that? <laughs> Mrs. Smith, you have black hairs on your lip. It looks just like a mustache. Or the ever-popular teacher, you look even older than my grandma. Younger children also have their own perspective on time-honored proverbs. As adults, we say, better be safe than sorry. Never bite the hand that feeds you. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. A penny saved is a penny earned. And if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and you cry alone. First graders say, better be safe than... Punch a fifth grader. Never bite the hand that looks sturdy. <laughs> you can't teach an old dog new math. <laughs> a penny saved is not much. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, get new batteries. <laughs> Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and you have to blow your nose. <laughs> At the university, as students, you are required to take many exams. 
Test-taking is another example of a skill we cannot learn from children, at least not from this student in Jordan School District. Notice how the student starts out with confidence. For those of you that might have a little difficulty reading first grade, or pardon me, grade script, I'll tell you, one of them says stumped, one of them says uh-oh. My favorite is, I think it's the bottom one on line, or the last one on line three that says, is there a teacher in the house? <laughs> or in the next line, is it almost time to go home yet? I love the hard and the stumped. Children are great learners, but it does take time for them to grasp some of the gospel principles. I'd like to share a short video clip now that I appreciate um, T.C. Christensen giving me permission to use. Fasting is um, uh, like on the first Sunday of the month, you don't eat anything. And that's staying close to Heavenly Father. Fasting is when you don't, you don't eat fast. It's when you want to eat fast. I don't know why I'm supposed to fast, but I'll do it. What does fasting do for you? This makes me hungry. <laughs> Are you going to go on a mission? Yes. Yes. Maybe. I don't think so. I want to go on a mission. I'll go if my mom goes with me. <laughs> I hope they call me on a mission. And then they call me on a mission. And then they call me on a mission. What is tithing? Tithing is when you take the stones and then you put in it, like if you have ten pennies, and you take one away and give it to the bishop, you still have nine left. What do they do with the money? I think the bishop buys his clothes with it. Do you like family home evening? Yeah. Why? Because sometimes on family home evening, the whole family just plays games and draw. Sometimes you don't even learn anything. Some, all the time we learn how to love each other. I say my prayers every night so I can be a better boy. Someday when I get married, I'll, I'll have a family and I'll teach them about the gospel. I'm glad that my mom and dad joined the church and I'm thankful for that my dad can hold the priesthood. I think Jesus is the head of the church. It helps us learn so we can keep learning better and better. So we can so we can go up with our Heavenly Father. Lessons and qualities we can learn from children. Children can teach us humility and trust. Some time ago, a friend of mine who was teaching first grade asked some students to help her distribute papers. Those of you who remember your first grade years or have little brothers and sisters or children in first grade know that they produce a, quite a volume of paperwork. So Miss Tranner said to the little girl, Honey, if you'll lick your finger, it'll stick to the pages and you can sort those pages faster. Miss Tranner looked back some minutes later, and the sweet little girl was going. <laughs> I love that story. It's both humorous and touching. What a responsibility it is to give directions to children, most of whom will try faithfully to do as they've been asked. Every family has examples of the teachableness of children. My brother Lynn was teaching his son to bat a ball. He was little and was having trouble holding up the tip of the heavy bat. Lynn kept saying, choke up, choke up, and you can hit it. 
But despite his repeated counsel, his son did not slide his hands closer to the middle of the bat. When Lynn got closer to the batter to show him where to put his hands, he realized that each time he had called up, he had called out, choke up, his son was <laughs> and continued to swing the bat. Children can teach us perseverance. Children know that anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. They are not very skilled at most of the things they do, but they keep trying. Tying shoes, riding bikes, roller skating, reading, helping in the kitchen. As adults, we often develop a different kind of attitude. If we can't do it well, too often we don't want to do it at all. We are less likely to participate in activities we are not good at. We become less and less willing to do that which is difficult for us, especially if someone else is watching our poor performance. Children can teach us an appreciation for little things. Children appreciate the simple things, laughing at their jokes, calling them by name in church, listening to their endless stories, a handshake, a pat on the back, a letter or card, recognizing their achievement, their talk, or their baptism. Children want to save these notes and cards forever. If all the mail you ever got was a birthday card from your grandma who lives out of state, or all of the family mail addressed to occupant, you would save those personal notes and letters in your desk for a long time, too. All adults should attend a week of show and tell in the youngest grades, and they would quickly see how their cards and notes of encouragement are especially valued by children. Several weeks ago, I attended meetings near Bryce Canyon and went for a walk in the forest with a few colleagues at the end of the day. We saw deer and wildflowers and many kinds of trees. In a short time, we covered a lot of ground because we didn't keep stopping to, look, to pick up rocks or look closely at a bug or select from a variety of walking sticks along the trail. Walking with a child in the mountains or in the park or even in your neighborhood is a richer experience than walking with adults because of the detail they notice and appreciate. Children can teach us a seamless perspective. They don't as easily separate church from the rest of their lives as we do as adults. While observing a math lesson in the first grade of a local elementary school, my student teacher held up a giant penny and said, this is an important American president. Do you know which important American president is on the penny? Her first graders responded with, Abraham Lincoln. That is correct, she said. She turned the penny over. On the back of the penny is also a very important building that is a tribute to President Lincoln. The student said, that is the log cabin where President Lincoln was born. She said, that's a good guess, but this is a very formal building. It's white. It has big pillars. It was built in Washington, D.C. to honor President Lincoln. Then another little girl called out and said with confidence, that is the building where President Lincoln was resurrected. <laughs> when I shared that incident with a colleague, she had a similar experience watching a similar lesson. When her student teacher said, do you know whose head is engraved on the penny, her class answered almost in unison, Gordon B. Hinckley. <laughs> the student teacher carefully explained the differences between church presidents and American presidents and then confidently held up the nickel to another choral response of Spencer W. Kimball. <laughs> in each general conference, we are counseled to be sure the gospel is reflected in our lives daily, at home, at school, in our work, as well as in our church responsibilities. Children see the gospel with an elegant simplicity that teaches and builds testimony. Primary leaders throughout the years have been inspired to design programs and select music that continue to help us as adults. I am touched with the number of CTR rings that I see worn many years after primary for Choose the Right. Students in my local elementary school coach each other in the hallways with WWJD, what would Jesus do? That question is not an oversimplification. It is always a good question for adults as well as, as, well as children to ask when, the, when we are faced with difficult decisions. The time we spend in the company of children makes us better people. I often read this poem by Berta Kleinman at the orientation for our student teachers. If I would travel the Holy Land, I need not travel far for the kingdom borders near at hand, where the feet of the children are. One more time. If I would travel the holy land, I need not travel far, 
for the kingdom borders near at hand where the feet of the children are. Scientists concur with prophets and with poets that children influence us for good. Tom Lovett, a noted psychologist, says, quote, Because teachers are with youngsters and can witness their insights and their revelations, teachers are relatively sane, nonviolent, and honest. Most of the people I know who work day-to-day with children do not rape, pillage, plunder, or get involved in extortion plots. Perhaps the reason they don't engage in such high-powered wrongdoing is that they are too tired from teaching. But I would contend that the primary reason that teachers are adequately socialized is that their children have helped them. Their pupils have kept them honest by challenging some of their values and by providing them with fresh strategies for viewing the environment. Now, from lessons to lifelines. Years ago, while water skiing with a friend, Bruce, we found ourselves in trouble as a thunderstorm with high winds moved so quickly over the lake we had no time to seek the shore. A large wave broke over the motor, and the boat slid backwards under the water. Our swamped boat continued to float just under the surface, with just the windshield visible above the surface of the water. We held on to the side of the submerged boat as we waved for help to other boaters who were also making their way to shore in the storm. As luck would have it, the first boat to arrive held three young men, so young that I was surprised to see them piloting a boat by themselves. As soon as they arrived, they shut off their motor. A mistake. Again and again, they attempted to throw us a rope, but they were not strong enough and the wind prevailed. When they couldn't restart their motor, they too were in trouble. I remember saying as I shivered in the water, I hope those kids don't drown because they stopped to help us. Just a few minutes later, two larger boats appeared, and we were encouraged to see they both held adult occupants. The wind began to subside almost as quickly as it had begun, One man threw a tow line to the boys, called out a few instructions, and they were headed toward the dock soon, towing the boys who were whooping and hollering, obviously enjoying this adventure more than my companion and I. (laughs) A man in the other boat threw Bruce a line. He said he had seen our boat go under and had immediately altered his course to help us. Gratefully, we collected the floating items from our boat and passed them to our rescuers. A short time later, we too were headed to shore in our rescuer's boat, towing a windshield and without any whooping at all. I think of that ill-fated trip when I see children in trouble, particularly young boys, riding the waves in troubled homes. I know the importance of a line thrown to a child by a concerned adult inside or outside of the child's family circle. Some families live, some children live in families very different from those typically profiled in the friend or in the ensign. They live in conditions that are far from the nurturing and safe environment we try to provide for all children. Marian Edelman penned the following. Loving God, we pray for children who put chocolate fingers everywhere, who sneak popsicles before supper, who can never find their shoes. And we pray for those who stare at photographers behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who are born in places we wouldn't be caught dead. We pray for children who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions, who hug us in a hurry and forget lunch money, who cover themselves with band-aids and sing off key. And we pray for those who never get dessert, who can't find any bread, who don't have any rooms to clean up. We pray for children who spend all their allowances before Tuesday, who pick at their food and who squirm in church and in synagogue. And we pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who will eat anything, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep. We pray for those who want to be carried and for those who must, for those we never give up on and for those who don't get a second chance, for those we smother with love and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. Close quote. All children receive many incorrect messages from media. In the 4,000 hours they watch before starting elementary school, according to the U.S. Department of Education, they compete with the 800 hours they get from primary influences. In most families in America, only sleep consumes more of a child's time than watching television. 
I recently attended presentations by Ronald Slaby and James Barbarino, both of whom who study youth violence in America. They reported there is increasing aggressive behavior in children across the nation. A desensitization to violence as evidenced in the popularity of professional wrestling and other shows with violent content. Young boys become fascinated and mimic what they see on television, on playgrounds and in their backyards with younger brothers and sisters, sometimes with deadly results. Our local Division of Family Services also reports an increase in child against child, child violence at younger and younger ages, an alarming increase of children accessing pornography on the internet during unsupervised time. There are many children in need of rescue today. They are in our neighborhoods, our ward boundaries, and our communities. Their rescuers will be caring adults like you. Quote, some longitudinal studies, several of which follow individuals over the course of a lifespan, have consistently documented that between half and two-thirds of children growing up in families with mentally ill, alcoholic, abusive, or criminally involved parents, or in poverty-stricken or war-torn communities, do overcome the odds and turn a life trajectory of risk into one that manifests resilience." Close quote. One of the three key factors in reversing the expected negative outcomes was the presence of at least one caring person. If that person was outside the family circle, he or she was most frequently a teacher. Most of us grew up with the phrase, every member a missionary, reminding us that missionary work is a shared responsibility with full-time missionaries working in a complementary role with members of the church who have been called to serve lifetime missions. In the new edition of Teaching No Greater Call, an excellent resource, it stresses every member a teacher. This new resource gives strategies for mothers and fathers for family teaching, ideas for home and visiting teaching, even how brothers and sisters and extended family can better teach the gospel in the home. When the resurrected Savior taught the Nephites, he said, Hold up your light that it may shine into the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. How do we, as university students, neighbors, or ward members, throw a line to a struggling child? I have a few suggestions. Number one, we look at the example we are currently providing to the children in our lives, and we remove the negatives. Do we engage in teasing and belittling and put down humor that sow seeds of anger in young children? What model do we provide for our younger brothers and sisters? Do we correct children by reteaching and not by embarrassing them, pointing out their mistakes while in the presence of other family members or friends, a strategy most of us wouldn't dream of using with coworkers? but used frequently without thinking when we correct children. We increase the positives. Do we understand the powerful example we are to younger brothers and sisters, the value of that note, that card, that phone call, or that quiet time together? Remember, these are little people who pick up sticks and save rocks they find in the driveway. We remind ourselves of how much is taught in our families when we thought no one was watching. A Simple Gesture by John Schlater When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator, and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake, and I knew that little things were special. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I believed there is a God I could always talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come to your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's okay to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared, and I wanted to be all that I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked, and wanted to say thanks for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. After looking at our example with the children we currently have in our lives, number two, we seek the Spirit to guide us. Who are the children in our families, our neighborhoods, our wards who are caught in stormy situations? Can we identify a child today that needs the help of another caring adult in his or her life? 
Most of us have little experience with children in crisis, and we'll need inspiration to know how to show our love and our willingness to help the family in the most effective way. Number three, we alter our course to help. We listen, we show kindness, we recognize their good efforts, we teach them by example. We widen our circle to include them whenever we can. There are no quick fixes here. Like children, we'll need to learn to persevere and celebrate small improvements. Children who have learned to be survivors may at first rebuff those who try to help them. I remember with sadness a third grade boy I had in Las Vegas who didn't have shoelaces. And so I bought a pair of shoelaces and put them on the side of the desk. And when he came to have his math checked, I said, Dale, I have an extra pair of shoelaces. If you want to use those at recess or keep them, your shoe won't fly off every time you kick the ball. And he immediately said, I don't want them, I don't need them. And the next day at math, I didn't bring up the shoelaces, and he said, do you still have those shoelaces? I said, I do. And he said, I don't need them today either. I said, that's fine. The third day when he came to math, he said, I want those shoelaces, but I don't really need them. And I said, you're welcome to have them. Number four, we enlist the help of others for a network of support. We contact our bishops and request their help. Reaching out to families often requires the combined services of a ward. We do some social engineering with the other children we can influence, teaching them how to friendship and reach out to these children to give them a happier life. Children in challenging family situations will keep riding the swells until someone alters their course to help or until they are lost. The lifelines can't all be thrown by agencies and school teachers. As a parent, son, daughter, husband, brother, sister, church leader, classroom teacher, home teacher, visiting teacher, co-worker, neighbor, or friend, you have opportunities to touch children. Many of you have expended great effort to send sons and daughters or brothers and sisters on missions to foreign countries. While younger, priceless converts, the children within our own ward boundaries and communities are slipping away. In his closing remarks in the October 96 General Conference, President Hinckley asked us to resolve to seek those who need our help, who are in desperate and difficult circumstances, and lift them in the spirit of love into the embrace of the Church. I'm grateful to live in a ward where I see families who have the gospel in their lives reach out to children in need. I know all children are precious in the sight of our Heavenly Father. As caring adults, we have a responsibility to love, to reach, and to teach, as our Father in Heaven instructs us to do. I pray this day that we will each re-examine our influence upon the children within our family circle and then reach out with a rescuing hand to those children we know do not live in the light of His love. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.